speaking now on Channel 107 to Guitar Mal, who is spending time in Irkutsk, Siberia, Russia. What is life like? Irkutsk lies in the south and east part of Siberia. It's very remote indeed, although it is one of the most heavily industrialized parts of Asia, if not the most. It is also very close to one of the largest lakes in the world. Guitar Mal has gone there for a trip. So I speak to him to find out more about what life is like in what he dubs as sunny Siberia. He is based in the small town of Angarsk, which used to be closed to any foreign visitors. When I called him on Skype, it was almost half past 11 at night where he was, some eight hours ahead of the UK. That part of Siberia shares the same time zone as mainland China. Hello. Hi. So I'm speaking to I'm speaking to Guitar Mal. You're usually based in Cheshire, um, only about halfway across the county, but now you're a third of the way across the world because you've actually gone to the far east of Russia. Um, but not, not quite the far east, but actually a long way east across Russia. You're in Siberia. Um, you're in a part of the world um, that's known as the Irkutsk Oblast because the oblasts are known as the regions in Russia. Yes. Um, so, what, what what's it like then, simply, um, uh, cuts? Because, I mean, I, I've heard that it's one of the largest um, conurbations and towns in the entire Siberian region. Oh, well, I guess that's true. I mean, um, you probably know more about the general geography of the region than I do, but uh, I'm actually staying in uh, the, the main conurbation north of Irkutsk, which is a new town, um, which is about 60 years old, I think. Uh, it was established from scratch, a bit like Milton Keynes, if you like, and it's called Angarsk, or Angarsk. Um, so it has a population not as big as Irkutsk, um, but it's um, a sizable population nonetheless. Mm. And uh, in fact, up until very recently, I think maybe 10 years ago, it was still on uh, the list of Russia's secret cities that um, visitors were not allowed to enter, basically. Oh, right. I mean, what's there now? What can you see, you know, as a visitor now? <laughs> There's actually not a lot to see. Um, in fact, what there is on the edges of town, you and I would be very familiar with, which is really like the Russian equivalent of uh, the Stanlow oil refinery and all the various chemical and petrochemical works surrounding it. Um, we've got the same sort of background of um, you know, like a water source as this big Angara River and the salt, the availability of salt and there's, I presume uh, coal and things for firing up the industry but it's it's it all looks very familiar in terms of you know Stanlow um, for example and, and pipes everywhere and things and steam coming up a bit like you know when you're driving through the edge of Northwich or something it's all a very familiar sort of industrial landscape in a way so it is a heavily industrial area um in yes. Irkutsk, you say it's petrochemical. Um, generally, yeah. What what are all the different things? I don't know. Um, I guess um, I don't know. You know, I'm only sort of looking at the, the visible industry. I don't know what what associated industries there are there. You know, it's um, the petrochemical thing is the most obvious one, and I think that's the thing that the town is mostly based on but chemicals obviously as well you know the the, the outskirts of town where the the this sort of industry is has a, has a very reminiscent smell of witness and run corn <laughs> it's all very familiar and would you say it's as vast as um, the Stanlow Industrial Park? Because that is absolutely huge. Would you say that it's just as big in scale, what they've got? Um, 
I don't know. It's difficult to gauge because um, most of the time I'm in town and uh, practically we went for a drive. Um, someone took us for a drive and just a little sightseeing tour, if you like, of the industrial parts. And yeah, it seemed it seemed big, but I don't know how much of it I actually saw. If you see what I mean. Well, I, 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 yeah, exactly. It could be it could be so big that you just don't know how much of it you actually saw. Now, you know, you, you said when um, when you you did your first Facebook update from um, Siberia because you know you, you actually were there for quite a while. You didn't get online, so that gave the impression of it being quite remote. Um, that you were in sunny Siberia. Now, Siberia is known for being very cold, but um, what's it actually like where you are? Well, you see, it <laughs> it it has seasons, <laughs> believe it or not. It has uh, winter and summer and spring and autumn. And uh, summer uh, can be very hot. Um, and we're we're just the same as England. The seasons are the same because right where I am now is uh, in the same latitude as Birmingham, for example. Um, although, you know, the being in the middle of a vast continent changes the weather patterns a little bit. There's no Gulf Stream or whatever, but uh, it's it basically it shares the sort of same seasons as, as we do. Um, so we're going at the moment from summer into autumn. And just before I arrived, the weather was, they had bad weather for a week. Uh, when I arrived, um, it turned into very good weather, very very hot. Um, one day it was um, it was like it was just continental. It was like the south of France. Wow, um, that's not even something. like Libya, in fact. And it was thirty four degrees when I they had some uh, there was a, a petrol station with a, a thermometer thing, digital thing, and uh, it said thirty four degrees. And then yesterday evening, for example, we were out all day. We we on a on a, a little tour of the um, Circum Baikal railway, and we got back into Irkutsk at eleven o'clock in the evening, and it was still showing twenty degrees on one of these temperature things. Wow! Yeah, so, I mean. But you're not going to be there into the winter. I mean, I presumably it gets very, very harsh around Christmas or something like that. I mean, you know... Starting from... Yeah, starting from... I think they said November. Once it freezes, it freezes, and that's it. Everything stops. You know, um, road works, building work, everything. And it's then it's solid, frozen for three months or four, I don't know. But generally, um, you know, I think temperatures drop to as low as minus 20 or something like that. But generally, yeah. there are even colder parts of Siberia where, you know, the well, summer temperatures don't even reach this sort of level. So, it, No, the average temperature is minus 20. Wow. So that's an average... I mean, it's an av averagely <laughs> bloody cold temperature, obviously. I mean, that, that's it. It was uh, minus 45 some part of last, uh, last winter here. So whereabouts yeah, in, in the world is this uh, really if, if you wanted to picture it if you wanted to picture it's very easy to find actually if you're looking at a globe or on google earth or something you just have a look at the whole of russia then scan about halfway across and at the bottom of russia there's a lake which is diagonal from us like bottom left to top right i mean it's it's just like a diagonal long lake and that's lake baikal and uh, this is the largest freshwater lake in the world. So it's easy to spot for that very reason. And Irkutsk is at the bottom end of this this huge lake. So I mean, this is I mean, this is putting you on the level of being quite close to Mongolia and, and, and China in the world map. Almost, almost on the Mongolian border, in fact. Uh, it, it was probably quite a long way if you tried to drive there, but. Um, it looks close if you look at the map. Uh, I'm sure it isn't if you try to, to actually go there. But yeah, it's on. It's pretty much on the Mongolian border, and there's a lot of um, people of Mongolian origin here, um, mainly because, of course, they were 
they were the original inhabitants and uh, they were invaded by the the, 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 the the Russians, you know, the sort of Caucasian Russians or whatever they, you know, the people we normally think of as being Russians are basically uh, uh, as original here as the, the so-called Americans are in North America I mean, it, and Australians are in Australia, it's just invaders basically. I mean, it's an area that has seen some conflict in the past due, due to that. Um, so, would you say that a lot of people, I mean, the further you go east, it's going to sound very crude, but people start looking more and more Asian with those Asian eyes. So, you're seeing a lot of that because that, you're quite far east in, in this part of Siberia. Let's say, I, I don't know, I, if I had to guess, I'd say about 5% of the people have that sort of appearance. And apparently, well, it's it's a really strange experience for me because quite possibly I'm the only person in the, in the whole of Angarsk who speaks who is English, and possibly one of the very few who speaks English. And it's very strange because um, every time, you say, we're standing somewhere with um, a crowd of people, as soon as I open my mouth and start talking, everybody looks around. <laughs> oh my God, what's this? Because Actually, the, then they're used to hearing foreign languages from people who look different. But apparently, I blend in uh, quite well into the, the general appearance of the majority of the population. I, I don't look on Russian because they, they think of themselves as being European. It's quite a Caucasian look, generally, isn't it? That kind of carries Basically, across Europe and Russia. So they they really not used to hearing Caucasian people speaking anything other than Russian. So it's quite strange. <laughs> I get quite conscious of it as soon as I start talking English. It's not immediately Everybody obvious, but it's... it's like <laughs> it's like what's this? It's and to be the only person in town, probably the only English person in 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 a in a huge population. It's, it's really quite um, a different experience, really. And would you say that, you know, the language simply is Russian? Yes. It is, apart from, the, you know, there are the, the still the minority languages, um, but everybody here has to speak Russian, really. But is there a sort of dialect going at all? Because sometimes, you know, in, in places that are very, very vastly far apart, I mean, you know, she, you often find that, that there's a culture that becomes sort of isolated a bit more. I mean, do you see that? Do you see a dialect? I think it's like in Wales, you know, the biggest, the biggest cities, uh, they speak English and then you need to go out into the country to hear the the original languages and uh, apparently it's the same here. That's a great analogy really to describe because you know it's such a big city that it's probably connected very culturally to the rest of Russia. So yes, yeah, so we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that now. What, what What's that like as a city then? Irkutsk as you rightly pronounced there. Well, um, I don't know if I rightly pronounced it. It's probably not far off. Um, you see, most of my time really is spent in Angarsk, which is quite different to Irkutsk. So, um, and Angarsk is, as I say, a new town, and it's quite easy to describe, really, because it's it's um, it, it's constructed mostly of these Soviet-style apartment blocks. Um, which can all look very similar. Quite municipal, quite... Um, oh, very municipal, yeah. Extremely uh, similar, yeah. Yeah, except there's there's a lot of... In between, there's a lot of trees, um, a lot of wildflowers, um, wild, wild plants. Um, yeah, it, it all seems very regular when you first encounter it but then the more the longer you're here the more you discover the different parts of town and there's the older center and uh, there's the old uh, original like siberian type dwellings um wooden i would say wooden shacks they're not really shacks but they're houses made of originally of logs and um there's an awful lot of them 
in an extremely dilapidated looking condition and at first sight you think surely nobody lives there but in fact they do and it's um <laughs> it can be a little bit disconcerting a lot of them have like um subsided so that they're not they're not flat and level anymore and they just seem to be a general state of dilapidation and i was quite worried about this until you know traveling through the countryside and the, the, the same sort of buildings the, you know the original siberian type buildings they all seem to be in much better repair and the, the, it's like the inhabitants seem to take more care of them it's like as if it's being in the city um it, it, it just don't it just don't care anymore it's it's all a bit of a mess Maybe that's the same everywhere. It would be the same if you were going through Birmingham, for example, or in the suburbs of, I don't know, any big, big city, compared to, say, going through a little village in the Cotswolds, for example. Mm, it's just you know, what's needed to get by. I um, guess. And, you know... So what... Um, so what can you find in the shops, then? What, what What's it like for supermarkets and things like that? Well, let me just say a little bit about Irkutsk, uh, and... Uh, because that's what you originally asked me about. It is, I mean, yeah. I've been to Irkutsk about far, four or five times, I guess, um, visiting. So I've seen quite a lot of it. And uh, it's a much older city. I think it's like they're celebrating something like 350 years. And it's quite a very interesting history. So culturally it's and architecturally, it's a lot more diverse. Um, and, and it's it, it's it's a it's a flatter city in the terms of it hasn't got so many apartment blocks, so all the buildings there's a lot more like two story buildings. But one thing that really strikes you about everything here, that whether it's the buildings or I guess mostly the buildings, but colour schemes in general, is the colours are all different. You know, they choose colours, paints, and different combinations of paints that just you wouldn't see in in Britain, for example, and um, it's very nice. It's all it gives a whole different feel to the the city. I mean, you get these beautiful deep blues and things on the some of the buildings, the older traditional buildings, but on all the buildings, you get all these sort of pastel shades of blue and green and yellow and even purple and things. It's it makes it all look very different. Well, that makes it sound less conformist, generally. I mean, there are a few examples of where um, villages in Britain, etc., they've they've chosen to paint houses and make it much more colourful, but then, you know, well, generally like speaking, there's a lot more... for example. Yeah. But, Scotland, but, say. Or Lamberis in North Wales, believe it or not. I saw that there was a lot, there was a lot of um, buildings painted there yeah. in bright colours, and it makes it a lot better than just the dull, usual dull and dreary um, towns and cities that are all conformist and that. But did you, um, in a cut, though, did, did you actually see any um, global brands? Oh, there are global brands, but not so many. Um, I would say. Um, Y yes, um, really not. I'm trying to think Adidas, for example. Um, but you don't really, you, you're asking about the shops. The yeah. You don't, the shops are barely recognisable as shops to, to sort of our European way of thinking because some of, well, some of them are, and, but let me say there's two different types of shops or there's more than two different types of shops, but I'd say in, in, in the main, there's shops as we'd recognise them, where there's like a shop front and it's obvious what the general theme of the shop is, you know, like it's a fashion shop or it's a hairdressing salon or uh, something of uh, this nature. But most of the time there's a sort of door that seems so it could be any door that goes into any building, uh, nothing particular special about it. You go inside and it's like the nearest thing I could describe is it's like going into um, um, a, a market building, you know, market hall in England where inside the hall 
there's different stalls selling different things and owned by different people and so you go inside this building and you don't know where the time you go in you're not sure where exactly you're going and suddenly there's these these stalls and they're all they're all like um they're all in glass you know the walls are in glass um so you can't actually touch anything <laughs> you know it's everything is behind glass um and these stalls are so maybe the same size as a market stall in england um and um so there'll be one market stall selling like tea another market stall selling fruit well they're not called market stalls they're actually the shops within the shops they call them pavilions pavilion or something like that